record on this computer and we are good. It's off to you. Uh, and I will add people as they log in late. It's all you, Bumaka. All right. Uh, thank you for the introduction, Rob. And hi, everyone. <clears throat> Welcome to today's webinar. Uh, so when it was decided that the topic of the month will be cybersecurity, we decided to not only talk about the requirements of 510K documentation, but also convey the importance of uh, cybersecurity and talk about the effects of not having cybersecurity integrated in the system early in the process. So in this session, um, I will be giving a brief introduction to cybersecurity in medical devices. Rob, if you can go to the next slide, please. Um, I will be giving a brief introduction to cybersecurity in medical devices, where it actually applies, and guidance document for cybersecurity, like the FDA guidance documents, uh, AAMI TIR 57 and NIST uh, standards. I will also be talking about the scope and content of the related documentation requirements by the FDA for a 510 case. So they are threat modeling, cybersecurity risks, vulnerabilities, and hazards cybersecurity controls, traceability analysis, plan for continuing support, and cybersecurity labeling. So it's necessary that you address the following uh, requirements when you're submitting uh, the cybersecurity documentation to the FDA or 510K documentation to the FDA. Um, I will be also giving a brief overview of the post-market considerations as well. Next slide, please. So um, these are some of the key components of uh, cybersecurity. So it's important to know what an asset, threat, and vulnerability is. So asset, as we all know, it is anything that has value. Uh, it can be to an individual or to an organization. So for example, it can be a list of all the device hardwares like laptops, smartphones, devices for sale, or OTS software, firmware, and other device components, and internal and external stakeholders. Also, roles and responsibilities are also important. It will be a part of an asset because these are the individuals uh, with access to sensitive data. And vulnerability is nothing but the weakness in your system. So let us say um, a risk is assessed by threat, vulnerability, and an asset. So this is uh, so the Venn diagram that you see is not a strict mathematical, it's not a strict model or a mathematical formula, but it just shows how you can determine the risk. So let me give you an example. Uh, so you place a device in the network and the network is very vulnerable. So it could be because you have no firewall or antivirus. So, but the asset becomes critical. So the risk is high. Next slide, please. Um, okay, so medical device cybersecurity, what is it? So probably all of you in the audience know what cybersecurity is. So it is a collective method of protecting your critical systems, networks, programs, and sensitive data from cybersecurity attack or unauthorized access. It means that you're developing a process to prevent unauthorized access to your device information and patient data that may in turn lead to device modification and misuse. So that will directly affect the patient safety or lead to patient harm. Medical devices are more connected to another, an, another device, or it can be connected to your network or app or internet. Because of the increase in connectivity, the hackers are trying to hurt you through your medical, through the medical devices. So now you may ask, how will they hurt you? So imagine a pacemaker where a hacker is changing the configuration or the code in the embedded software program it will ultimately run out of battery or it may start pacing at a higher rate. So this impacts patient safety. Now, again, you may ask, what is the necessity? Why are they attacking? So most of the identity breach in the US alone happened in healthcare and uh, hackers will have access to your health record, address, SSN, insurance information and date of birth. So these are valuable information. So they can open a new credit card or maybe have high narcotics, um, high price narcotics or get a bank loan. Uh, so this is one of the main reasons hackers go after medical devices that target the patient health data. And what, the, what should the manufacturers do to protect their device from cybersecurity attack? So the purpose is to make your device robust by ensuring that 
confidentiality, integrity, functionality, and availability is not compromised during breach. And how will you do is something that we will go through more in detail in the upcoming slides. Next slide, please. Okay, now, um, where does it apply? So like I mentioned in my very first slide, uh, medical devices are connected. It can be connected to another device, which can be wireless or hardwired, or it can be connected to a network or an internet uh, that can be Wi-Fi or BLE, or to a portable media that will be USB or a CD. Uh, since the technological landscape for software in medical devices is rapidly growing, the information is easily accessible and available by different means. So in order to make the system secure, it is best to design it from the beginning. So do not consider um, cybersecurity as just a feature integrated into your system, but make it a property of a well-designed system. Uh, just like how risk management or risk analysis goes hand in hand with planning and design phase, just like that. Um, oftentimes, manufacturers think that if the device is not an implant or if it is non-sterile, but carries all the features that it's free from an attack. Um, now we've been seeing a lot of small device manufacturers that have the best technology and features that any person could ever want. So that could cause a lot of problems. Um, one of the main issues we have seen recently is that manufacturers are not addressing cybersecurity vulnerabilities in internet of medical thing devices. So some manufacturers may either be slow in addressing the security issues because they have fewer resources to work on security or they have large code bases. Also, they are driven by the speed to market and they also think about the cost involved or some may not be aware at all. So just know that as soon as you place your device in, on the network, or if it has a portable media, or if it has a software app, they become a hackable system because you have a programmable logic in it. So let me give you an example of a wheelchair. So the wheelchair is a class two device and it has features to remotely control the device via smartphone app. So this device is at a tier one risk of a cyber attack. Why you may ask, because uh, it's just a vehicle, right? What is the necessity? So. Now let me give you some scenarios. So imagine a disabled person using the same wheelchair and experiencing a potential lockout during an intrusion. Um, the asset information can be hacked. And also because it's the user uses a smartphone app, home network information can be hacked as well. So these are just a few examples of how you can actually think like a hacker and implement the methodologies to identify your vulnerabilities, mitigate your hazards in order to prevent your device from an unknown or an unexpected harm. Next slide, please. So, Cybersecurity risk will also have some tiers, tiers of risk. So this is taken from the FDA's draft guidance that talks about classifying the risk into tier one and tier two risk. Uh, tier one being high cybersecurity risk, uh, the device can connect, connect to another medical or a non-medical product or to network or to the internet. If there is a cybersecurity incident, um, it could affect the device and it could directly result in patient harm uh, or multiple patients may be affected. So some of the examples uh, that I can think of is uh, pacemakers, dialysis devices, ins insulin pumps or infusion pumps. Um, and talking about tier two, tier two is a standard cybersecurity risk. So any device that is not defined by the tier one definition falls under tier two risk. Next slide, please. Okay, so pre-market guidance for cybersecurity. So uh, this is the guidance document that most of the manufacturers actually follow if they do. So let me just uh, say that pre-market cybersecurity guidance document is um, will at a minimum talk about risk assessment approach to cybersecurity before the product goes into the market. So you can also say that it mirrors um, ISO 14971. So what FDA actually wants is the inclusion of cybersecurity as part of your design control activities and that the software validation must be reflecting that approach as well. Uh, 
So let's talk about a few um, important points here. Uh, so first is the identification of threats, assets, and vulnerabilities. So assets, like I mentioned, they are something that we value. And threats, assets, and vulnerabilities are the attack vectors in your system architecture. So attack vector, um, and so let me just tell you what an attack vector is. It is a pathway or a method uh, that a hacker uses to access um, network um, or device with an intention to exploit the system vulnerabilities. So some examples of attack vectors to launch attack in medical devices are debug ports bought out on a USB port, BLE feature, and firmware uh, updates are the most popular attack vectors. Um, and then assessments of impact of threats and vulnerabilities being exploited. So these are the impact assessments for the attack vectors that cannot be protected from a threat um, or those that are vulnerable, vulnerable to an attack. And determination of risk level and suitable mitigation strategies. So you determine the levels of risk identified and implement risk controls to protect the data or prevent access and assessment of residual risk and risk acceptance criteria. So residual risk can be acceptable or unacceptable based on how your vulnerability is, whether it is controlled or uncontrolled. So I will be going through it more in detail while talking about post-market post cybersecurity requirements. So now, um, FDA has officially recognized AAMI TIR 57 as a cybersecurity standard for medical devices. So in fact, FDA staff members have contributed to this standard. So in the future slides, I'll make references to NIST and AAMI TIR 57. So I just thought I'd bring it up early uh, so that you don't get confused as I talk about it in the later slides. Um, the pre-market guidance also talks about five core principles. Um, published by NIST, that is National Institute of Standards at US Department of Commerce. Uh, the features of NIST framework is to identify, protect, detect, respond, and recover. So it's not mandatory, but it's recommended by the FDA. Uh, and I will be talking um, in the later slides about it. Next slide, please. Okay, so now what's the purpose and the key principles? So the main purpose of the guidance is to provide manufacturers with the guidance to guidance on pre-market submissions for device approval with cybersecurity risk management and to create trustworthy medical devices. So let's talk about some key takeaways from this guidance. So as I mentioned in my earlier slide, cybersecurity is just not a feature, but a property of a well-designed system. So what do I mean by that? Um, a device cybersecurity is integrated early in your total product life cycle or software development life cycle. So that starts with the initial design and ends with the disposal of your device. Also re remember that it's a joint responsibility of healthcare providers, patients, stakeholders, and manufacturers. And also ensure that your design inputs for device related to cybersecurity, um, have your design inputs for cybersecurity, and also establish cybersecurity vulnerability um, and management approach as part of your software validation and risk analysis that is required by A2030G. So that is to say that software validation must be reflecting your cybersecurity approach as well. There are some key concepts to keep in mind. Uh, so pre-market guidance always focuses on patient safety. And by safety, I mean safety by cybersecurity. And for the same reason, you have to identify the risk, propose security requirements, implement your mitigations, verify and validate. And then documentation, uh, of course, I know that documentation requirements is the primary focus of this webinar. And I will be discussing about hazard analysis, trace matrix, um, in-house controls in a few minutes. Um, and I would also like to state that FDA, NIST, DHS, US, US Department of Health and Human Services that follow HIPAA rules are working together to define procedures for product safety, uh, security, data privacy in order to keep the patients safe. Next slide, please. Now let's talk about AAMI TIR 57. 
So these are the principles for medical device security uh, risk management. So it is a foundational uh, cybersecurity standard that FDA has formally recognized. Um, this standard must be used where cybersecurity is actually a concern. So FDA recommends TIR 57 in its guidance. Um, now, it is actually based on the application of ISO 14971 risk management principles to the device, medical device space, and um, it provides, it also gives you a detailed view of risk management. So for your information, the structure of AAMI TIR 57 is copied directly from 14971 standard. Um, if I'm not wrong, I think it's section three to nine in the TIR 57. Uh, the structure defines how the security risk management and safety risk management are modeled in the same way. Um, I know that the main focus for cybersecurity will be around the concepts of security risk management. So just know that if you're comfortable with safety risk management, that is ISO 14971, then understanding the concepts of developing security risk management should be pretty straightforward. So now let's look at the model. I believe it's self-explanatory, but let me give you an overview. Um, the model describes the relationship between the safety and security risk management process. Uh, that is between ISO 1497 and the security risk process. Um, then security risks may impact the safety of a medical device. So if you can see those crisscross arrows, safety risk control may impact the security risk analysis and vice versa, stating that a security problem will become a safety problem. So one example um, that I can uh, think about is the networked infusion pumps to deliver fluids or medications to patient's body in a controlled manner. So examples of uh, some drugs delivered through infusion Fusion pump can be insulin, chemo drugs, hormones. Um, so for the safety of the device, the pump receives say, regular software updates and uh, also the drug li library will also get updated with default dosage information. Imagine if there is an intruder or let's say an attacker will gain access to the library. This will lead to the change in dosage information and deliver inaccurate dosage to the patients. So if it's insulin that's being delivered, the patient may suffer from hypoglycemia, hyperglycemia, or diabetic ketoacidosis. Um, now I think you get an idea of how the safety risk will impact the security risk. So the annexes in TIR 57 actually has a wealth of information and it also contains practical methods to implement risk management process. It also has a list of questions uh, on how to identify security risks, uh, just like safety risks in ISO 14971. Um, as mentioned earlier, TIR 57 supports risk management and it also refers to 14971 for um, uh, 14971 for safety risk management and NIST 830 for conducting risk assessments. So to anyone who would like to know more about risk management in terms of uh, process management and the impact on, your, on the processes, so this is a go-to document. Um, also for those who would like to know if this is harmonized to EU MDR, sorry, it's not harmonized. Next slide, please. Now, um, NIST. So NIST is the National Institute of Standards and Technology at the US Department of Commerce. So in order to improve the critical infrastructure of uh, cybersecurity, FDA recommends its manufacturers to apply NIST in both pre-market and post-market stages. So for now, let's consider the pre-market stage and later I'll talk about how it's applicable to your post-market stages. So these guidances actually talk about uh, the principles of manufacturers that manufacturers can follow in creating a trustworthy device. So like I mentioned, there are five core functions in NIST framework, that is to identify, protect and detect, respond and recover. Protect and detect deals with vulnerability assessment and risk analysis. Respond and recover talks about compensating controls, risk mitigation and remediation. So you can also consider them as measures taken to secure devices and protect patients. By measures, I mean um, um, measures taken to protect data, 
detect cybersecurity events, respond to incident, and recover from an incident. So when you consider NIST framework in the pre-market stage, you are you must think about the design considerations that address cybersecurity. Next slide, please. So first function that we will be talking about is identify. So identify, we'll talk about identifying assets, uh, threats, and vulnerabilities. Um, Assets can be roles and responsibilities, um, or it can be a list of physical assets, including your laptops, phones, or endpoint devices, um, or it can be information assets like patient data, network configurations, then roles and responsibilities like those individuals who have access to your medical device and its sensitive data, as well as stakeholders like healthcare providers, users, users such as uh, clinic clinicians, patients, caregivers, consumers, and regulators. Um, so uh, consider identifying assets as a part of your system characterization. So having this information will ensure that every attack surface will be addressed. So this will be covered in threat modeling um, a little more in detail in the uh, future slides. So then let's uh, talk about identifying threats. In NIST, um, threat is divided into threat source and threat events. So threat source is someone who attempts to uh, get an unauthorized attempts an unauthorized access to the system or device to exploit vulnerability. So it can be an intentional exploitation or an unintentional exploitation. Threat source can be internal or external to the organization. So let me give you some examples of threat source. So types of threat source can be individuals like your insiders, like employees or patients, a structural threat source such as IT equipment, your software or environmental controls such as temperature or humidity controls and power supply, and environmental threat sources such as earthquake, bomb, bombing, um, hurricane, infrastructure failure or outage. And next, let's talk about the threat events. So threat events are initiated by threat sources. So here you ask three questions when you're dealing with, when you're trying to identify the threat events. You're asking three questions. What are the tactics, techniques, and procedures used to implement the attack? So for example, it can be delivering malware, phishing, um, spoofing, tampering the data. So these are explained much more in detail in NIST 830. Um, so use that. And uh, vulnerability identification, like I mentioned, it is to identify flaws or um, flaws in the systems that can be exploited. So example, um, so a very simple example that I can think of is poor password practices. Next slide, please. Um, next, let's talk about the function protect. So these are um, more about uh, the controls that are implemented to prevent the logon to the network or computers uh, or devices. Implement your technical controls, um, information controls, physical controls, or administrative controls. So technical controls, um, I think most of you already know they can be to protect unauthorized access to software such as firewalls, passwords, or it can be multiple authentication methods and antivirus software devices or active updates of operating systems. Um, and in, in general, uh, some of the controls that you can think of is conducting regular backups of data, having formal policies for safely disposing your electronic files and old devices, and um, up, like I said, update uh, security software regularly and automate those updates if possible and encrypt all the sensitive data. Next slide, please. Next function is detect. Um, I think uh, it is pretty straightforward. So in case you want to identify an event or if there are any uh, suspicion of violation to your organization's security policies, then you have to, uh, you, you have to think about detecting those. Um, it talks about how the security compromises will be detected by your organization. So you may have to implement different features 
uh, that allow potential events to be de detected and recognized. So in addition to it, you, you also understand the impact of the events. So this can be done by continuous monitoring. So it can be through routine audits of your network, continuous monitoring, like you can monitor your network system, or it can be host-based, or it can be wireless. So and also monitor unauthorized access and unauthorized users and connections. And um, in order to do that, it's better to have a plan in place. So plan the detection mechanism mechanism way ahead and also implement some intrude and use some tools like um, Intru use intrusion detection systems uh, to detect an intrusion and consider detection as an ongoing assessment of risk. Next slide, please. Next function is respond. This function is more concerned about how the organization will respond in case of an event. So how will you provide the information to the user about the appropriate actions that will be taken upon uh, the detection of a cybersecurity event. So for that, device manufacturers should have uh, an external communication plan in place for disclosure of any breach. Uh, there must be communication and disclosure policies to regulatory agencies, and they may be uh, insiders like users, or employees, media, or investors as well. So this is also related to common vulnerability disclosure. So I will be explaining about common vulnerability disclosure when I go through the slides for post-market cybersecurity. Um, also have an incident response plan. So the plan in the plan, your organization can talk about incident response strategies, complaint handling procedures, and external communication plan. Like I mentioned, how will you answer the questions to the relevant audience during a breach? Um, and discuss appropriate actions uh, taken upon um, detected security breach and company's mitigation efforts. So example, how will you retain the operability? Um, how will you recover the information? Mitigation efforts to prevent further impact or expansion of the event. Um, and also it's important in an organization to implement improvement plans. Uh, it will be based on the lessons learned from the current and past incident response activities. Um, and also um, just a quick note, uh, it is important to discuss if the company also plans to ensure insurance coverage to the sec for security breaches, and also make sure you have standard operating procedures in place to respond to cybersecurity. Next please. Next slide, please. Let's talk about recovery. So recovery plan, it's one of the most important thing to execute and uh, recovery plan can be done during your independent assessments and penetration tests uh, that takes place before your product is released to the market. Uh, the plan can include some recovery planning procedures uh, to recover or restore the assets that have been impacted. Or you can also create a plan during the design phase to log or backup or store any sensitive data so that the data can be easy, easily recovered when there is a cybersecurity breach. So this could include methods like, like I mentioned earlier, retaining operability or recovering information. And also um, performance improvement plans, so like it can, or different mechanisms. They can be corrective action mechanisms. So for example, you can give, uh, you can have a training procedure in place to update and address new threats in the uh, SOPs. So how the organization will deal with the cybersecurity breach and its remediation efforts, how will the organization retain operability and function of the device during the breach uh, must be included in your recovery plan. Um, and implement device features that protect the critical, uh, critical functionality of your device, even when the cybersecurity has been compromised. Next slide, please.
um, actually report is not uh, reporting is not part of NIST, but I thought I'd bring it up as um, it is also one of the important aspects of cyber security response action. Um, so your organization should always have a plan and some procedures to report intrusions or breaches to FTA and other regulatory agencies. So in the event of a security breach, manufacturers must comply with MDR reporting requirements. So that is 21 CFR Part H03. And if the cybersecurity breach has impacted the safety and effectiveness of the device and um, it puts the hospital network at risk or the patient data at risk, then you have to file a voluntary report through MedWatch 3500A. So I have provided link in the slides. Um, link in the slides and more information can also be found in section one and eight of the post-market cybersecurity guidance. Next slide, please. Now let's talk about the pre-market submission documentation. So manufacturers should always establish um, and document and maintain an ongoing process for identifying hazards associated with the cybersecurity of the device, evaluate and control the risk, monitor the effectiveness of the controls. FTA is aware that all the cybersecurity risks cannot be anticipated. It is impossible. So for the same reason, FTA recommends that all manufacturers document the process to assess the cybersecurity risk as much as possible. Next slide, please. So uh, these are the pre-market cybersecurity documentation requirements. Uh, they are threat modeling, cybersecurity vulnerabilities and risk, cybersecurity controls, traceability matrix, plan for continuing support, plan for malware free shipping, and cybersecurity labeling. Uh, so for your reference, I've added section numbers in the guidance against each requirements, uh, so you can go through it much more in detail, but I will also be covering it in the later slides. And remember that threat modeling is a risk management process in itself, and all the categories like the cybersecurity vulnerabilities and risk controls, traceability matrix is all part of threat modeling. Next slide, please. Now let's talk about threat modeling. Um, threat modeling is an important aspect of security development life cycle that aims at building a more secure system. Um, threat modeling will enable the organization to be built in your system or device with some security requirements. Um, it does not address cybersecurity as an afterthought, therefore it is conducted at the design phase. So threat modeling also aims at identifying assets, analyze threats, vulnerabilities, and mitigate them. They can be performed in four steps. Diagram, so what are we building? Identify threats, what could go wrong? Mitigate, what are we doing to defend against those threats and validate how have we acted on each of those previous steps. So these steps that I just mentioned will make more sense when I go through the risk management process through threat modeling in the later slides. Next slide, please. Okay, so let me just give you an overview of threat modeling. Um, we know that cybersecurity risk management is a process of identifying risks and evaluating those risks. Uh, threat modeling is one of the best methods to improve, improve security. The flowchart in this slide will give you an overview of uh, threat modeling. So threat modeling follows the stride method, which has six categories of security risk. Um, so spoofing, tampering, repudiation, information disclosure, denial of service, elevation of privilege. So spoofing refers to claiming a false identity. Tampering will be you know, malicious modification of data. Repudiation is the ability of denying that an action or an event has taken place. Um, and information disclosure refers to data leaks or data breaches. And denial of service is that when you 
when the network resource is unavailable to its intended resource. Um, and elevation of pri privilege refers to gaining access that one should not have. And each of these categories will be concerned with one security aspect, like you can see authenticity, integrity, non-repudiation, confidentiality, availability, and authorization. So once you've identified the security aspect of the risk, you identify the threats. So they can be social, operational, technical, environmental. So this is where you can also use NIST 830 or TIR 57 standards for the last two steps, that is to implement your controls and identify your threats. And then the last step would be to implement your mitigation process or drive your mitigation process and implement controls. Next slide, please. Okay, so risk management with threat modeling. So cybersecurity risk management can be implemented with threat modeling. Uh, so this slide shows a flow chart describing uh, how risk management can be implemented in your organization using threat modeling. So first is the architecture diagram. So one thing to remember is that intrusions and breaches will always occur through your weakness in the system architecture. Therefore, threat modeling emphasizes on the importance to have an architecture diagram. So this is one of the four steps, uh, the very first step in threat modeling where they say diagram uh, to see what you're building. So in the architecture diagram, you will decompose the system into components. Um, you're basically creating a flow diagram or a component diagram, and you build interaction between those components based on your device design. So this will help determine the attack surface. Next, like I mentioned earlier, you use Stride in order to identify your assets, threats, vulnerabilities, and implement your security controls. And next will be to create a model. So create a model to determine the possibility of an attack. So create a model by placing the identified threats, assets, and vulnerabilities, as well as security controls. So what you're doing here is you're placing um, all uh, placing those risk assets, vulnerabilities, and controls in the architecture diagram uh, in, that I explained in step one. So by that, I mean, you just mean, uh, what I mean by that is that locate, uh, uh, mark the location of the threat agents, assets, and security controls. So this is more like cre creating a th threat landscape uh, that will help determine the motivation of an attacker. And you'll also get to know what the skills and capabilities uh, required to locate the potential attackers in relation to the system architecture. And next is to identify gaps. Um, how, do you determine, how do you determine if the attacker can defeat the control? Um, like I mentioned earlier, code reviews and traditional testing will be able to spot implementation attack uh, implementation errors in the system architecture, but security design flaws cannot be spotted. So what you're doing is creating a threat landscape. So threat landscape is also not sufficient, but you must also be able to test the landscape for security loopholes, and you must come up with methods to better defend your networks and system. So in order to do this, threat modeling will always promote the idea of thinking like a hacker. So by hacker, I mean the tester becomes an ethical hacker, where you will, as a hacker, you will implement offensive and defensive methodologies to identify vulnerabilities, mitigate the hazards in order to prevent your device from an unknown or unexpected harm. So one of the most common security testing is penetration testing. So here you become the hacker and exploit the vulnerability of the device in a controlled fashion. So this way you will be able to find the security loophole in the system. So consider an example of phishing where the target will be sent a malicious email and he will be successfully tricked into providing the credentials. This is one of the examples on how, as a tester, you can get a foothold into the network. So that way you will be able to identify if a threat agent can reach an asset, if appropriate controls have been implemented between the threat source and the asset, identify any missing controls, or you can also see if, those, if there are any weak controls and those weak controls can be defeated 
along the way. So performing penetration testing will answer such questions and help remediate those gaps along the process. So you may ask, what if the testing is not performed? Um, why is, uh, you know, what, what, is threat landscape not sufficient? Of course, let me just give you some of some uh, scenarios. So scenario one, so we know that antivirus is used to stop something malicious from happening in the system. So imagine what can happen when an antivirus software starts running in the middle of a heart procedure, right? All the data required to perform the procedure is locked and thus it prevents the procedure to halt. It will lead to patient harm. So this kind of accidental harm can be caught during security testing. And also uh, imagine another scenario of an unexpected harm. Um, plug the cell phone for charging next to an anesthesia machine and the machine shuts down. So you have, so this is an unexpected harm. Who would actually think this would happen? So you have to make the system robust to un unexpected harm as well. And you must ask questions along the way. And next step will be to prioritize threats where you will do impact assessments and assess the likelihood of threat. So you can either follow NIST or TIR 57. Remember, uh, TIR 57 also references to NIST 830. So they're all interlinked in a way. The level of threat, threat is determined for any natural, human, or environmental source to exploit any identified vulnerabilities. Next slide, please. Now let's talk about a few advantages, uh, mostly summing up uh, the previous slides about threat modeling. Um, some of the advantages of conducting the threat modeling at the design phase are that it helps detect problems early in your product life cycle, or let's say the software development life cycle. Um, oftentimes, code reviews and traditional testing may overlook many design flaws. Uh, so threat modeling will come in handy to spot those security design flaws. Like I already mentioned, um, you can identify most of the likely attack vectors, and it gives you a clear picture of new attack vectors that would have otherwise gone unnoticed. Next slide, please. Let's talk about uh, the threat modeling documentation requirements. So the highlights are actually taken from the eStar template. I'm pretty sure that you all know what an eStar template is. So like I have mentioned earlier, threat modeling identifies threats, assets, and vulnerabilities. Uh, as per the guidance, identifying assets, threats, vulnerabilities, and controls, uh, and this process process is commonly called threat modeling. Um, the most important information that FDA will require for documentation is to identify your threats, assets, and vulnerabilities. So FDA is not specific about the method that you're using. So you can use your NIST, TIR 57, whatever suits your organization and your device. The key is that you have provided this information and it was considered during your design and development phase. But this is an important information that your 510K documentation must include. Also remember that risk management with threat modeling addresses the following items. I think I've already mentioned this, just reiterating, cybersecurity risks, cybersecurity controls, and traceability matrix. Next slide, please. When medical device vulnerabilities are not addressed or remediated, so they can serve as access points for entry into hospitals or healthcare facility networks, right? So vulnerabilities may lead to compromise of data, confident, data confidentiality, integrity, and availability. So this will be a safety issue again. Again, NIST and, NIST and TIR 57 standards will be a good resource that will help you identify well identify vulnerabilities. It could be applicable to your device as well. But like I said, there, there is a wealth of information um, and a list of questions that you can go through and uh, make it applicable to your device as well. Um, some items to, uh, so this is, uh, this part of documentation must cover the cybersecurity risks that were considered in the design of your device. Uh, some items to address in this section are risk, um, or potential hazards, severity of harm, 
device design consideration um, and risk mitigation methods and risk acceptance criteria. Next slide, please. Okay. FDA has included some examples in their guidance of different types of controls, but uh, it's not an exhaustive list and FDA is not specific about what style, like I've, I've been saying this over and over again, they're not very specific about the standards or guidance that you use as a reference. NIST and TIR 57 standards will come in handy too. So what you're doing here is that you're providing a justification with the type of controls that you've implemented to mitigate those risks for your medical device. So therefore it is important that you have proper controls uh, for the intended user and intended use of your device. So. Some of the examples are network controls, uh, like it can be wireless protected access or firewalls, and also application controls like authentication to use the app or device controls such as strong access controls or communication encryption and user controls, uh, training on security controls to avoid end users end user errors or misuses or potential device lockouts. And also remember that if you're working on an EMC device, your uh, cybersecurity controls uh, should also mention the measures taken to avoid the electromagnetic inf interference as well. And then of course, traceability matrix, it links between your hazards to controls and your re cybersecurity requirements. Next slide, please. Now plan for continuing support. So this talks about uh, the plan by manufacturers to implement um, a program for um, updating the software on their devices regularly. So that can be uh, software and operating system updates that address security vulnerabilities within a program or a product. And how do you plan to validate, validate those updates, right? Some of the best practices for software updates would be to avoid software updates while using untrusted networks. Um, so as new vulnerabilities constantly emerge, it's better to keep your software up to date as a defense against the attackers. Um, and it's also important uh, on how you will require the user to consent automatic updates. How will you make it feasible for the users to safely implement security updates? Or how will you release the updates to fix performance bugs, um, as well as provide enhanced security features? How will you validate the patch updates? So these are uh, some of the best practices for software updates that um, I can think of. Um, then you have plan for malware free shipping. So these are nothing but uh, in-house controls where you describe how you will ensure the safety and performance of the device software from the point of origin to the point where the device leaves the manufacturer. So suppose if the device is free of um, malware when it leaves the manufacturer and the type of testing or analysis has been performed before the release. So this can be included in your plan as well. Malware is just an example provided in the guidance uh, since it is the most common type of security threat. So therefore this section must address uh, some of the proactive approaches that your organization has taken to defend this type of threat. Uh, it can be by installing anti-malware programs, recognizing uh, suspicious links, files, websites, etc. Another example uh, I can think of besides malware will be a phishing attack. Uh, so for example, a password theft where an attacker is trying to steal your credentials. So the manufacturer must implement a two-factor authentication as a protection method. So this is how um, you can implement your in-house controls before the device leaves the control of the manufacturer. Market cybersecurity management. So this defines the requirements on how the vulnerabilities are handled after the product leaves the control of the manufacturer's um, manufacturer. So that is, it applies to any marketed and distributed medical device. Um, now, while pre-market recommends the use for uh, NIST for design. Pre Post-market recommends the use of NIST to address public health. Again, uh, post-market guidance talks about identifying your threats, vulnerabilities, and assets. Protect and detect talks about 
uh, vulnerability assessment and risk analysis, respondent recover talks about any remediation efforts, risk mitigation or compensating controls on the threats that have been identified risks that have been identified and uh, post-market cybersecurity in medical devices makes it very clear that the manufacturer must monitor, identify and address cybersecurity vulnerabilities and uh, exploits as part of their post-market management plans. So it provides a risk management framework to detect, assess, report and mitigate cyber threats. Next slide, please. Do you have an effective post-market cybersecurity risk management plan? So manufacturers risk management program and documentation should be consistent with several federal regulations that already govern medical device manufacturers. So these CFRs are integral to any organization. There is actually nothing much in the guidance that exclusively points at cybersecurity in the CFRs. Uh, so I'll be just giving you a brief overview. Uh, Quality system regulations, this has nothing specific to cybersecurity, but it does reference to software that is A2030G, which talks about software validation risk analysis and complaint handling. If there is uh, if there is a cybersecurity breach and someone reports it, how will you handle those complaints? And this section must also address the incident response strategy or strategies or complaint handling procedures. Um, and quality audit. So you're auditing your system requirements and um, making sure that it's, it is compliant with cybersecurity risk uh, management. Uh, and then we talk about corrective and preventive action, that is CARPA. Uh, this mostly talks about performance improvement plan or mechanisms. So like I mentioned earlier, so some of the corrective action mechanisms uh, for the vulnerabilities that are identified in the system will go into the corrective and preventive action uh, documentation. And next, let's talk about A2030, that is software validation and risk analysis. So this will require manufacturers to establish and maintain procedures uh, for validating device design, including software wherever appropriate. So the identification of design methods, the date, and the individuals who are performing validation must be documented in the design history file. And servicing, uh, will require manufacturers to establish instructions and procedures uh, for validating the patch. But again, like I mentioned, there is not, nothing much in the guidance. So I just uh, ran through it. Um, next slide, please. So post-market guidance describes um, a way to detect and monitor the cybersecurity vulnerabilities uh, in your devices. So understanding, assessing, and detecting the level of risk a vulnerability poses to a patient. And you're establishing a process for working with cybersecurity res researchers and other stakeholders to receive information about the potential vulnerabilities. Uh, this could be through your common vulnerability, uh, vulnerability disclosure policies that I will be discussing later, and deploy mitigations such as software pay patches to address cybersecurity issues before they are exploited and caused harm. Next slide, please. So some of the key principles to remember that uh, post-market cybersecurity is a collaborative approach to uh, information sharing and risk assessment, and also use your code of federal regulations to ensure compliance uh, where the products consist consistently meets requirements and applicable requirements and specifications. Next slide, please. Let's talk about risk assessment. So post-market risk assessment is nothing but vulnerability assessment. So there are two things that you're assessing here. Uh, that is the severity of harm to patient if uh, the vulnerability is exploited and exploitability. Uh, so here we are talking about exploitability or vulnerability. Um, so I think most of you already know there is something called as a common vulnerability scoring system. Uh, this is a tool that is commonly used for assessing the exploitability. 
the CDSS will help manufacturer evaluate the safety and potential impact of cybersecurity vulnerabilities and threats. And also remember that CDSS calculates severity and not risk. And um, there are about 10, 10 elements in the system. So you score each element in the ranges from zero to 10, and the resulting score will help you determine the severity and the and uh, we'll let you know if the vulnerability is controlled or uncontrolled. So the graph uh, is taken from the post-market guidance and it will come in handy as well. But remember that CDSS is giving you a quantitative assessment, uh, whereas uh, your post if you're considering the graph, it's more like a qualitative assessment. Um, and also, we will be providing links to uh, CVS's document and its calculator, so you can go through different metric groups and metric values, which are very well explained in those documents. Next slide, please. Let's talk about controlled and uncontrolled risk. So controlled risk is when there is um, low residual risk, or let's say acceptable risk of patient harm due to a device's uh, specific cybersecurity vulnerability. So um, examples will be routine updates and patches that are device enhancements. I think Matthew just talked about it, um, about the device enhancements. Um, and also let's consider some uncontrolled risk. So uncontrolled risk is present when there is unacceptable residual risk of patient harm due to insufficient risk mitigations. So if the risk is unacceptable, the medical device manufacturers must remediate uncontrolled risk of patient harm and bring it down to an acceptable level as quickly as possible and implement a mitigation measure or compensating controls. So implementing compensating controls or those who don't know what compensating control is, it's a temporary fix. So when a fix is not feasible or immediately available, you just give a compensating, you just implement a temporary fix. So also know that not all vulnerabilities may be known during your design and development process. So implementing a compensating control uh, as and when new vulnerabilities are discovered during your post-market phase of the product life cycle is completely acceptable. So let's just put it simply. Um, unacceptable, unacceptable risk will lead to patient harm and the risk must be reduced to an acceptable level. So in order to do so, you must implement corrections like mitigations and compensating controls. And remember uh, that you must communicate the vulnerability within 30 days of learning about the risk to your customers and manufacturers will have about 60 days to implement the fix, validate the fix and send a deployable fix to its customers. So also know that if there are no adverse events and there is a fix within a specified timeline and the manufacturer is an active participant in the information sharing and analysis organization, then the reporting requirement is not applicable. Also, you can follow part 806 reporting requirements, uh, and I think manufacturers must follow, and it depends on whether the action is taken in response to a controlled or an uncontrolled risk. So if it's just a device enhancement, manufacturers don't have to report, and um, uncontrolled risk will require reporting under part 806 before you because you're implementing a fix to remediate the uncontrolled risk and to, in order to bring it down to, an, to a controlled or acceptable risk. So this slide will, all, slide will also align with the slide that talks about uh, reporting, I guess, slide 16, uh, that you can look into it uh, once this, these slides are being shared with you. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so this is the coordinated vulnerability disclosure. Uh, so I'll be just giving you a general overview. Uh, it is a process in which the vulnerabilities are disclosed after a sufficient time has passed, after a patch of mitigation is developed. So usually security researchers will identify the vulnerabilities and contact the manufacturers. Security researchers and manufacturers will do some vulnerability analysis and manufacturers will be given an opportunity to prepare a fix before disclosing the vulnerabilities to the public. So manufacturers will start preparing the fix, validate the fix, 
And may, so remember that this is a process between the security researchers who found the vulnerability and the manufacturer remediating the vulnerability. So it's important to maintain an open communication channel and uh, have some good reporting policies. So once the fix is released, the person responsible will re disclose the vulnerability according to the organization's, organization's reporting policies. So this is where detect SS report mitigating cybersecurity threats per NIST comes into play. Next slide, please. Join the information sharing and analysis organization. So I think this happened somewhere around uh, 2013 when an executive order was issued to address the critical infrastructure of cybersecurity. And FDA issued a memorandum of understanding with the ISAO that all device manufacturers must join this organization. Um, it is not mandatory, but it is strongly recommended in the guidance. Um, it is a cyber uh, information sharing platform. This way, the risks that have been identified or threats that have been identified by different manufacturers will be shared with full transparencies to, transparency to other parties. And uh, the advantage of joining ISAO is that manufacturers can become informed. So if you're developing the similar product or not, uh, the risk, a threat, or vulnerability could still be applicable to your product as well. So you will get an idea about the operation of the device and see if the strategies meet your device needs. Um, remember that I talked about a scenario where uh, you will plug the cell phone for charging next to an anesthesia machine and the machine shuts down. So this is an unexpected harm. Who would have guessed this could be a possible threat? So joining these organizations will help in gaining awareness to such risks. Of course, the organization will, um, joining this organization, the manufacturers will gain insights about innovative strategies to respond, detect, or recover from a risk. You will also be able to learn about the risk assessment framework implemented. And if you choose to participate in an ISAO, you will receive notifications about incidents via automated real-time mechanisms. And it's a 24 bar seven threat warning system. Next slide, please. So action items, okay. So the best way to make your system secure is to design it from the beginning. And cybersecurity measures must be implemented throughout your total product life cycle of the device. That is from the design to disclose, disposal. Don't implement cyber security just as an afterthought. Make it as a make it a property of a well-designed system and maintain good cyber hygiene. Use threat modeling, AAMITIR 57, that we went through in detail to identify your threats, vulnerabilities, and assets that will help determine your security risk. Use NIST cybersecurities, uh, cybersecurity frameworks, five core functions as part of your design consideration. And also, uh, I just forgot to tell you that after a string of ransomware attacks on healthcare sector over the past year, I believe on May 12th, President Biden has signed a cybersecurity executive order that voiced concerns about cybersecurity in medical devices. So it has called for NIST to broaden its standards and its best practices. So what I learned was NIST and National Telecommunication and Information Administration are working together on this. So as of June 8th, FDA has also called for NIST to fulfill uh, the executive order. Uh, I think now you get an idea of how serious this subject is getting and its importance in your devices. So next, you have to perform security testing. I think we've talked about in detail about uh, you know the, the why penetration testing is important. Also remember that it's just not the responsibility of a manufacturer to implement and protect the device. Make it a joint responsibility between the stakeholders, healthcare providers to ensure highest level of protection and effectiveness of implemented measures and develop a KMS plan. So remember connected devices do provide better quality of healthcare benefits will outweigh the risk. And just let me give you some examples of what I mean by benefits outweighing the risk. So imagine a patient with a pacemaker. The same patient can call for help when the patient becomes unresponsive. And imagine a diabetic child who has an insulin pump that will allow her parents to remotely monitor her blood glucose level and deliver insulin if the child needs it. 
So let me conclude by saying that connected medical devices or internet of medical things is not doom and gloom. Anything that's worth doing is always difficult at first. Therefore, integrate cybersecurity early in the design stages. There are well put guidances in place use it. Make your device a well-designed system, a robust system that will make your device worth it. And with that, thank you very much for your attention. Hey everybody, um, we've gone on an hour and a half. Um, and I, I just don't think I can uh, ethically uh, keep everybody on for another half hour while we go through all the questions that we had. We had 14 questions that were submitted to us by email ahead of time. We've had several questions that were submitted during the, the session in chat. So I think the best approach for us is going to be to um, respond to everybody that's registered for this. Uh, there are almost 60 people that have already registered for it. So that's fantastic. But we'll respond to everybody with an email uh, answering your questions as a frequently asked questions document. So everybody will receive that. And I think I might also be able to persuade uh, Bumaka or Matthew or both of them to do a little uh, on the side recording of answers to some of the questions, because we had some really good questions that could be webinars all on their own. Um, so really, thank you very much for all your time and patience. Uh, sorry for the delay at the beginning with the, the difficulties of logging in. I, I really am um, sorry that we didn't start quite on time as we had intended. If you have any questions that you want to submit to us after this session, please visit our suggestion box uh, page. I put the hyperlink on the page here. Uh, it's medicaldeviceacademy.com forward slash suggestion dash box. Um, if you type in a wrong page, so you get a 404 error, the 404 page is also our suggestion box page. So you can tell me what page you meant to go to and go ahead and put in the um, questions that you have or any questions that uh, are related to this session or, hey, could you do a webinar next time about this item? So we, we're always looking for great ideas for blogs, topics. Um, we've gotten a lot of great feedback on this. Uh, Bumaka did a fantastic job. This is her first webinar that she's done for the company and it was absolutely spectacular. Matthew improved upon his previous efforts as a webinar and I don't really have a word for it uh, other than awesome. So thank you, everybody. Um, I'm, I've, I've reached the point now with a team that I'm so lucky to have that uh, they're doing better jobs than I am. So uh, I'm just sitting back and enjoying it. Thank you, everybody. Um, if you want the contact information for uh, Bumaka directly, that's on the next slide. Um, so there's her email address. And then if you're looking for uh, contact information for anybody else on the team, I've updated our contact uh, page for the consulting team. So everybody's email is on there. So you can contact anybody on the team uh, by email and certain people have uh, phone numbers as well. And uh, Calendly um, uh, links if you wanna schedule a meeting with them. So that's on the, uh, the website. I've provided the link there. Um, we're also going to send the, uh, the native slide deck to all the people that registered. So if you registered, you're going to get the frequently asked questions uh, document with uh, 16 or 17 questions. So I don't know what the final count is. I'm also going to make sure you get the native slide deck and you'll get a link to the recording. And then um, after some editing, I'm sure we'll get a really fancy copy that goes out on uh, YouTube as well. So don't, don't forget to look at our YouTube channel. That's where we'll post some of the... Uh, the follow-up stuff that we're going to provide in video format. Thank you, everybody. Um, this was fantastic. We, we really appreciate your support. And um, don't forget to look at those emails because there will be some great valuable content in there. Um, I know Boomuk has been working on final edits to our work instruction. That will be helpful too. Talk to you later. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. We can, we can probably stop recording now. <laughs>